Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can I say amen to that first? Yes. Yes. That was beautiful. Thank you, Brian. Boy, what a pretty day, isn't it? Yes. Even if it was raining, it would be a beautiful day because we're here together. But this is what they call down south, uh, Carolina blue. <laughs> it is pretty. Um, we missed you all last week, but uh, we did get to watch part of the service, and it was, uh, it was good. It really was, and I'm glad you all uh, showed up, and we, you, a lot of good music and, and readings and things, and I hope you all felt, felt God's presence all last Sunday, too. So we're back. Uh, there is one thing I do need to say right up front. Um, our nephew, um, Chase, who was, uh, we, we said something, it was just the last moment, all of a sudden there was um, um, a young person in actually Huntsville, Alabama had uh, passed away, and Chase was to get his lungs and heart. They prepared everything, and at the last minute, they just did another check on the heart, and the heart was irregular beating, so they had to call it off at the last moment. So they're still waiting, but I thank you for your prayers, and if you would continue to pray, uh, and pray for the family of the one who lost the child. Um, so anyways, um, not to be a, a downer, but we, we have to understand that that is part of life as it goes. How did the wedding go? Oh, the wedding. <laughs> it was great. It really was. Uh, they had a wonderful turnout. It was about 100 people showed up. Uh, we're out in the total, out in the middle of nowhere, almost to North Carolina, believe it or not. And uh, it was just this gorgeous setting with the rolling mountains, uh, the, 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 the edges of uh, the Smoky Mountains and the trees and uh, just everything. It was a gorgeous wedding. A um, couple of people that really love each other. So. It was very, very nice. It was under. It was beautiful to, to, to be around the other side of the family and to get to know them too. And, and uh, so it uh, it will be wonderful. But thank you for asking. Yes, I want to thank Brian and Ellie and Matt and Paige and Shelley for the service of last week um, and everything that they put into that. And uh, we hope that you again did feel God's presence with that. This Tuesday, um, we're starting our the uh, um, the Bible study. Um, so if you haven't got the books yet, there's the five book series on the back uh, table back there. Just sign up. I see a couple more people signed up. The 10:30 or a six o'clock, and they're interchangeable. If you can only make the six one time and the 10:30 the next time, that's fine. So it doesn't matter. But um, those who are signed up, um, if you haven't read it first, you need to read. There's an introduction, and then read through lesson one because it'll be much easier to, to get started if you read in advance on this one. They do recommend that. Um, and also, I got a letter from Pentair, which was the old Myers here in town. They are, and I know not anybody here is probably looking for employment, but they're needing some people pretty bad to work out there. And so if you know someone that is looking for a great part or a full-time job, that uh, see me sometime, and I've got the phone numbers to call. But I just thought it was worth saying something because they did send a letter here looking for folks that would and do need uh, employment. And then also uh, crop walk is coming up. I hope, Dick, if it's all right, I'll just, uh, crop walk is the first Sunday of uh, October. Uh, see Dick or see Todd. Um, they're going to a virtual walk. <laughs> So for donations, but of course crop walk, the money goes for hunger around the world and also 25% of the money stays right here in the community too with um, food pantries and, and such. So keep I, that I, in your prayer. I might add a little something that struck me last night. I'm sure most of us here have to eat three meals a day. Well, I always eat three meals a day and a snack at night. And we had company over last night and had a nice snack. You know, I got to think that snack was probably more than some people around the world all day long. Yeah, that's exactly right. And for those that might not have heard it all, we're fortunate where we get three meals a day. And how many times do we snack? And some of the people around the world, our little snacks are what they may get in a two-day at times. That That's all they have access to. So that's part of what Crop Walk does, is, is help put food on the table for those that are in need. So are there any other messages or any other announcements that need to be brought forward. Then let us go to God. Thus says the Lord, do not let the wise boast in wisdom, but boast in their might 
or boast in their health, but let those who boast, boast in this, that they understand and know me, the God, and know that I am the Lord, and that I act with steadfast love, justice, and righteousness. For in these things, the Lord says, I delight. May we pray. O most holy God, we've come here to worship you and to learn from your holy word. Teach us so that we may live and to follow the example of Jesus and to love one another. And in Jesus' name we do all pray and say, Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn, hopefully you have a, a page, and if not, hold up your hand and we'll get one to you quick. Our opening hymn is The Power of Your Love.
The Old, scripture, Old uh, Testament scripture reading today is Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Um, I didn't have any um, prayer requests in the back. Does anybody have any prayer requests that they'd like to mention this morning? Yes. I'm having a CAT scan tomorrow and an MRI on Wednesday. We're trying to figure out what's going on with my body here. <laughs> okay. Okay. Your first name is? Karen. Karen. Karen's going to be having a CAT scan and an MRI just to figure out kind of what's going on. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, my sister Myra and my sister Julie are both having health problems. <laughs> Myra and Julie, just uh, some general health concerns there. We'll keep those in our, keep them in our prayers this week. Uh, anybody else? Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. <coughs> Ever-present God, you are here in this place, but we are your church. A church not made of brick and mortar, but of hearts and minds and hands. A church that's been redeemed by your grace. A church that's learning to forgive others in the same way that we've been forgiven. A church where peace and justice can prevail. A church where the outcast and stranger are, are welcomed. A church where hands reach out beyond these walls to heal, strengthen, and serve. A church where love and kindness pour out. We thank you for this weekly ritual, ritual of gathering in your name. And we pray for one another. We pray for those in our community who are struggling with the difficulties of life. We pray for those dealing with health concerns, including people in our community and across the globe dealing with the effects of the virus. And Lord, we offer up, especially today, Karen in our prayers. We pray that the testing that she undergoes this week will give her answers and a positive way forward. We also pray for Myra and Julie and their health concerns. Hear our prayers as we examine our own hearts, our own motives, and our own fears. Grant us the courage needed to see ourselves truthfully so that we can wash off the old and be cleansed for a new day. We now offer up the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power Lord forever. I think we should uh, offer another prayer for 
the helicopter that's coming in, we know it's going to the hospital, whether it's picking up someone. We pray for the person, we pray for the pilots, we pray for the doctors, and we pray for the, for the families that are affected. Be with them, dear Lord, and show your mercy with them. Amen. This month, we've actually been looking at the book of James, and I hope some of you have uh, taken the time to read the five short chapters, but there's so much packed into it. But I want to do a little bit of a recap, if you don't mind. A couple of weeks ago, James tells us that our works, our works are essential, not to get us to heaven, but our works are, are essential, and they're a natural outgrowth of our faith. If you remember, he said, when you find somebody that's hungry and naked, what do you do? You just go up to them and pat them on the back and say, good luck to you, or do you help them? And he's, in other words, if you don't do the work, if you don't help them, you either have no faith or the faith that you thought you had is dead. You see, faith and works go hand in hand. Last week's readings that Matt did from James 3, 1 to 12, it was he spoke of the great power of the tongue, which is quite often used in, used in destructive ways. And he pointed out three things, and I'd like to just go over them really quick. There was a bit in a horse, just a little piece of metal and two strips of leather. You can take this huge animal and make it do whatever you want by just that little piece of metal. Then there's a rudder on a ship. The rudder is the smallest thing, actually, on this huge behemoth of a, of a ship, but that little, if you pay attention to it, it can navigate the ship and make it go where you want. It's too bad they weren't doing that on the Titanic. They weren't watching what the rudder was doing. But then there was the small fire. A small spark of a fire can actually burn down a huge, great forest. And we're seeing that happening almost on a daily basis, it seems like, in California. So that's what he's saying about the tongue. The tongue is a small thing, but boy, it can it starts it can it start fires. So James is now encouraging us in what we're going to hear today to do our deeds, our works, and we're to do them in gentleness and in wisdom. And our speech should also be with gentleness and wisdom, not with boasting, not with envy, and not with lying. And then James is going to go along and he's going to warn us against ourselves. <laughs> Fighting that stems from lust and desires brought on by this wisdom of the world that are in direct contradiction to the wisdoms of God. So I'd like to read to you today from James 3, starting at 13 to the end, and then I'll read in James 4, verses 1 through 4 and 7 and 8. Who is wise and understanding among you? Don't you love it when they use rhetorical questions? He doesn't want people to raise their hands. But who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it um, and do not deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly. It's unspiritual and it's from the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Kind of sounds like parts of today, doesn't it? But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, and then it's peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. And sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. And doesn't that conjure up the sower of the seed? The sower of the seed needs to be a peacemaker who sows in peace. And then there's a great harvest. Chapter 4 begins, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill, you covet but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, 
you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. Oh, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. So submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, your hearts, you double-minded. Those are some interesting words, to say the least, are they not? I don't know if you noticed the big difference between chapter 3 and chapter 4. There was literally a dramatic change in his tone to the people. It was startling, shocking. James speaks of wisdom, but then he abruptly points a finger to the reader and asks, why do you fight? Why do you quarrel among yourselves? Look at the way you're acting to one another. What James is trying to do here is trying to shake us up and to make us think and to look at how we're living our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Where do we get our wisdom is the question that he's asking here. Wisdom only comes from two places is what James is telling us. It comes from the world, or it comes from God above in heaven. Wisdom from the world, he talks about in verses 15 and 16. That wisdom produces strife, bitterness, jealousy. It brings disorder. And all of these are ultimately from the devil. But wisdom from above, which was verse 17, is pure. It brings us peace. It's loving. It's full of mercy. And it, pursues, and it produces good fruit. What we need to understand is, James is referring to quarrels, lawsuits, rivalries, controversies, not daily disagreements or differences. Um, you know, Don Eden and I have little differences from time to time. You know, what color are you going to paint the kitchen, you know, or something. This is not what he's talking about. What he's talking about are... Oh, what, <laughs> yeah, it was. Well, no. But it's... It's, it's what happens between people, the hostile, the greedy, the wicked, the ways in which disputes were being handled and how disputes today are being handled. The desire for possessions and the, the hurting of others financially are high on the list that produces fights and controversies and contentions. Look at all the lawsuits today especially just on TV when you watch. You know, We've seen it for years now, asbestos Roundup is now in the bullseye, if you will. I used Roundup yesterday, but FDA-approved drugs after a few years are now being people who took them or they're able to sue people. Class action suits all over the place, and of course, how can we forget tobacco and hot coffee between the legs? <laughs> you know, there were three major downfalls in the Roman, uh, the Roman Empire. I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, history will tell us this. One, they offered open borders. Two, they, they wanted people to have more leisure, so the government basically gave you entertainment and provided food. And three, the thing that really toppled it all were lawsuits. You were able to sue anybody for anything as long as you were a Roman citizen. It was crazy. That's was what brought the Roman Empire to its knees. And then there were other major contentions that went on within all of that. There were the Pharisees and the Sadducees, for example, the Herodians, the Zealots, the Samaritans. They were fighting each other all of the time. We can make similar lists today, can we not? Lutherans versus Baptists, Catholics versus Mormons, Evangelicals against Pentecostals, the rich, the poor. The group, those lists can go on and on and on. One group is always pitted against another group. And, and even when two groups try to work together with each other, one group starts to exert its beliefs, and the other group pushes back. You know, I've always found amazed me over the years that I've done this and, and I've had uh, dealings with other churches where it's so hard to get two churches to work together for the same thing because everybody wants to do it their own little way and they want their own name on it, instead of all churches should be under the umbrella of doing things for God. You know, we sometimes forget that. 
That's the world of the wisdom of the world. But you see, all conflict has its roots in envy. It has it in desire for worldly things, a dominance of others. James is warning us just how easy it is to fall into the wisdom of the world, which always leads ultimately to destruction every time. In verse 4 of chapter 4, James turns up the heat, though, on the folks, and he hits them even harder. And maybe I should say it hits us a little harder, too. He calls them, you adulterous people, you adulterous generation. I added those, but that's what he's saying. Now, the original meaning of this adulteress is not how we use that word today. But its true meaning, especially 2,000 years ago, was those with greed and with worldliness in their hearts. That's what he's saying. They're the ones being condemned by James. And further, adulteress also means those who are unfaithful to God. And that's what he's referring to. We either have a relationship with God or we're separated from God by our actions. There's, not, there's no third alternative there. The world's wisdom puts us in direct discord with God. Now, don't confuse what I'm saying here of loving the world with its wisdom of the world. There's two things there. I love the world. I love looking out here at beautiful grass and trees and mountains and and um, the oceans and the valleys and all of those things. And guess what? All of the people are made in God's image. That's God's creation. God so loved the world, right? John wrote those words. But John also wrote the words, 1 John 2.15, he says, do not love the world. Well, there's a contradiction, don't you think? The same guy writes those two things. But see, he's say, stating exactly what James is trying to tell us also. There's nothing contradictory in here. God loves us. He loves because he gave us this creation. And we are to love each other. But the world, with its desires, its envy, its lusts, its greed, there's specific things that are manufactured by sinful man and ultimately the devil for no other purpose but to lead us away from God. See? Two separate things. And it all lays at the feet of the evil one. The world has Satan as its ruler. Last week's reading spoke of the tongue. Do you speak kindly or do you speak harshly of your brother? You cannot love God, the bringer of wisdom from heaven, and speak harshly or hate your neighbor who is also made in God's image, just like you. We need to choose which wisdom that's going to control our lives. If we love God, then we can in turn love our neighbor, unconditionally, by the way. And that's the hard part in this world, is it not? Because there's people out there that aren't being real nice. How do you love those people? But God says we're supposed to. And in turn, though, the love that we offer that's been given to us, if we offer it, it opens our hearts and fills us with the wisdom of heaven. And that will allow us a chance to love and to instruct others. You see, God loves us deeply. His desire for us is to be solely his, though, through our love and through our devotion to him. He really longs for us, yearns for us. And he loves us so much that he gave up his son for us. We need to keep remembering that. But he's also a very jealous God. He wants our complete devotion. And in return, the more we surrender to God, the more he blesses us. Did you catch that? The more he blesses us. And that, that is something the world can't even promise or do. James also points out that they were praying all wrong. He says, you're not praying for the things you should never pray for, things that you want, things that you that will give you pleasure, but you're to pray for others. You're to pray for God's will. You're to pray for his guidance. In fact, James's words, I don't know if it reminded you, but it reminded me of Jesus' words in um, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, where he says, ask, ask of God and it will be given to you. Seek, take a look around. Where is he directing you? And you're going to find it. 
and knock, knock, and that door will be open to you. It's what you ask for that counts. Prayer is the answer. It truly is. When we ask for wisdom, ask for guidance, ask for understanding. You see, if we pray and if we strive to live in God's wisdom from heaven, we will never sacrifice our eternal future for a brief and uncertain present here. Now, the beginning of verse 7, James uses a word that many people dislike, resist, and even scream about. So I've heard people scream about this word, and it's submit. Ooh, you know, we've heard that. Now, I mean, a lot of people won't even read what Paul wrote because he, read, he said, wives, submit to your husbands. <laughs> they, they forget to read the next line <laughs> for some reason. But, you know, the word submit, again, we've turned it into something that it was different 2,000 years ago. And it's best explained with the parable of the prodigal son, believe it or not. There's a young man that we know the story. He went along with the wisdom of the world. He went to his dad one day and says, I don't want to wait. I want my inheritance now. So his dad lovingly gave him the inheritance. You know, it's kind of like that commercial on TV, uh, J.G. Wentworth. Um, I've got this money set aside for me, but I want it now. <laughs> and he says, sure, we'll do that. They take a percentage of it, but do you really supposed to have it now? But see, that's what the man, the young man was saying to his father. So what did the world promise him? And once he got his money, he's going to have a great time. He's going to be able to party. He's going to have fun friends flocking around him and he's going to be able to buy whatever he wants whenever he wants no responsibilities i can't wait for that life but guess what money ran out his friends deserted him nobody was left around to help him and he found himself destitute he hits bottom rock bottom the world's wisdom failed him big time one day he realizes that his dad's pigs were eating better than he was eating. Well, I'll tell you what, that is rock bottom, is it not? So he comes home and he says, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. That is submission. That's what the word means. Submission is when you give in, you give up, and you turn over your life to something better. And that's when reconciliation with God begins also. It's the turning away from the world's wisdom. If you recall, the wayward son was tenderly welcomed back by his father. In fact, his father ran to him. God will run to you too when you come back. Imagine though how much more we're welcomed by our own heavenly father who loves us so. We need to remember that the turning away from the world is not easy. It really isn't. We're all tempted every day, every day. But with God's promises and his heavenly wisdom, it can be done. The world wants us to believe that temptations and envy and desires are insurmountable. I mean, think of the things that we've heard others and probably ourselves have even said from time to time. Well, I, I can't help it. Uh, well, everybody does it. Remember, you'd say that, and then your mom would say, what, you're going to jump off a roof because, you know. But everybody does it. It gives us an out. But James asks, does Satan and the world have more power over you than God? That's the end question. You see, we all have the power to say no. From the past, John, James is crying out to us, resist the devil. In other words, say no. And he will flee. And the more often you say no, the easier it becomes to say no. That's a, that's a little extra in there. You see, these are very wise words. The closer that we draw to God, the closer God will draw to us. He will run to us. However, if we resist God, God is going to depart from us. And then in verse 8, James calls us to clean your hands and purify your hearts. These are beautiful words, actually, because they echo Psalm 24, verses 3 to 5, and I'd like to read those to you really quick. He says just those two little things, but listen to what they really mean. 
the psalmist writes, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? In other words, who gets to go to heaven? Okay, that's what he's asking. And then he says, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. He who does not lift up his soul to an idol. That's worldly wisdom. And he who does not swear by what is false. See, those are exactly what James is telling us. And then he goes, and that person is he will receive a blessing from the Lord. See, James said, you'll be blessed and you'll be blessed. And he will be vindicated with God, his Savior, who is Jesus. Aren't those instructive words? I think we should read those every day. Every hand needs cleansed. Every heart needs to be made pure. And the only way for this to happen is to follow God in his heavenly wisdom, given to us by his son Jesus. And we're to leave behind the world and all of those misleading things behind. Jesus' words tell us these, and I think it's fitting to say them here, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And everyone who humbles himself in God's holy name will be exalted in heaven. Amen. I, I I've hesitated whether I want to say anything else, but I guess I've got a couple of minutes yet, and I suppose I should. Um, I didn't get to talk last week, so <laughs> I'm going to get a little extra today, I guess. I don't know if you noticed, there was a couple of words in there. Adulterous and submit. Those two words have changed over the, 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 the decades and changed over the years. Uh, in the centuries, actually, we, we, we in, in the English language, we do take words and we kind of, com, you know, combine them, combine them, combine them. But um, there was another word that uh, when I was doing my studies on this, and it really, really shocked me. And the, you're, you're going to kind of think this is in kind of a reverse, but but I don't think it is. It's, you know, kind of bear with me. At the beginning of the reading in chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Let him show it by his good life. The Tyndale Bible, which was the first English Bible written, and the King James also, it says, Let him show it by his conversation. That's an interesting word, isn't it? So would we not really think that... Um, Conversation means, gee, how we should talk to people. So how words change, and this is really what I wanted to talk about an extra minute or two. Adultery, adulteress, you know, we think of it in a certain way, but back then it was thought of as being unfaithful, especially to God. And to submit, it means to give up those things, those bad things you're doing, and give in to the good stuff. Conversation, though, took me the other way around on this, and, and it shocked me. When I did, when you go back to the original Greek word, which is about ye long, and I don't even think you could pronounce it, but what it means is we think of conversation as what we're doing here, and maybe some person listening and one person talking, and then some person talks and the other person hopefully listens. But conversation, especially the word in Greek means not just what comes out of here, but also your facial expressions, how you tilt your head, how you stand, all of the actions and reactions that you do is your conversation, where a person can look at you and can honestly understand if you're angry with them or if you're happy with them. You see, everything about your body is your conversation. We don't think of it that way anymore. And, and I just thought that was such an interesting little thing because then within the reading there were two other words that don't necessarily mean totally what we thought but mean a whole lot more. Whereas the conversation is the other way around. The conversation we think of is just a simple little talk back and forth, which, but it means all of our body language. Even what we wear tells someone something about 
us to them. Isn't that interesting? And then I started thinking about conversation, especially John 14 through 16 or so when Jesus was at the Last Supper. You know, he takes his cloak off and he ties a towel around his waist. That's conversation. That's, he's saying something with his, his actions. And we have to understand that our actions mean something to other people too. And Jesus spoke volumes, not only with the words that he said, but he spoke volumes in the actions that he did. So whenever you think of conversations, I think that's a, a great way to really understand that word of how we really interact with people aren't just words. It's not just what the tongue may or may not allow to come out, but it's how we look and how we dress, how we stand or how we sit. So, but Jesus spoke so much on that night and he spoke so much of telling them what he was going to go through, but also what they were going to have to be prepared to follow along. And I'm sure after his resurrection, all of that conversation came back to them and they understood exactly what he was saying. And praise be to God, those 11 men, along with Matthias and then um, Paul, took up the mantle. And we are still carrying on that conversation even today. So as we prepare to hear this conversation again that Jesus was telling them and telling us, um, let's prepare our hearts as we sing our communion hymn, Come Share the Lord. Thank you. 
For I received from the Lord what I now hand on to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then, in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and that you drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he again returns. Amen. bow your heads as I offer the prayer of offering and dedication. O gracious God, we dedicate these gifts for the work of your church. May they be acceptable in your sight and used to renew the spirits of the oppressed throughout the world. In Jesus' name. Thank you.